20. And recording. For those of you who don't know, I used to work in the Artemis program on Artemis 1 at Kennedy Space Center um, within the VAB and the LC-39 area on SLS. So that orange rocket has a uh, very important place in my heart overall. I worked on it for about four years. So during that period, I got very familiar with the systems, why certain things are the way they are, and it was very, very cool to be a part of that program during that time period. When I started down this, uh, this road of building thrust vector controlled rockets, the first rocket that I built was an SLS launch vehicle. So that first iteration was very crude. It didn't do as much as any of the current ones that I'm flying. But at the same time, it was, uh, it was totally different than a lot of the stuff out in the field at the time. It had a drone controller to be able to operate it. It was very simple, and it was kind of my first experience back into uh, hardware-based microcontrollers. My dog wants me to throw this. After that initial experience, I kind of went further down the, uh, the rabbit hole, and I tried to learn a little bit, and I eventually tried again with adding in thrust vector control on the boosters, but with a not very mature design. That flight went very poorly. Um, overall, the, the boosters didn't perform how I wanted. The timing was awful. And a lot of the changes that I implemented going forward were into almost every subsystem on the, the launch pad and rocket collectively. After that second SLS attempt, I went back to the drawing board and reworked a lot of the ground systems in the launch infrastructure. Um, the launch mount was completely redone to be able to restrain the rocket and not allow it to leave the pad in the event of static fire. Also, there was a lot of additional add-ons in the smarts behind the launch pad. Um, these were to prevent it from accidentally releasing the rocket, knocking it over, uh, dampening the retract of the mechanism. All of these different things uh, have been proved out over the course of the past year. So now that I'm pretty confident in how that's been able to operate, I'm now moving back into the realm of my SLS. Um, overall, the software is pretty much the same between the two, but with some changes there. I demonstrated and proved out the Solid Rocket Booster Thrust Vector Control System uh, about a year ago um, to be able to show that it can in fact move the rocket motor, deviate the thrust, and potentially control the vehicle uh, without having a problem and deploy the parachute. Um, that test was, again, about a year ago. So it's been some time since I've really cracked down on this project and, and got it moving forward. but. The incremental development of these type systems is slow because you don't want to make a mistake. And if you can make a mistake on a cheaper platform like the Falcon 9 back here, uh, then you do that instead of doing it on the more expensive one. A lot of that is uh, replicated in the full scale version of the, uh, the Space Launch System because they have a very, very intense test and verification program where they are testing all of these systems and making sure they all work before flight. But the frustrating part about that ends up being you have delays and no one likes delays, but as always, you know, having a launch scrub or a program delay is way better than blowing up the whole rocket on the launch pad. And I really don't want to have that happen for flight three. So with a great deal of confidence in my booster design, I ended up producing more of them with a few minor tweaks from the first test. Um, there was a couple additions like thermal protection uh, in the way of cork. The real SLS boosters actually have uh, a decent amount of cork applied to them to prevent uh, any sort of melting on the metal and insulate them from the heat of their operational environment. So mine also have that where there is a, a cork film applied on the interior. So when the ejection charge blows, it doesn't melt the plastic. I've had a lot of success with propeller testing on my Falcon 9. So I wanna do the exact same 
on my SLS where I was gonna use the propeller system similarly uh, to test out how the inputs and corrections and movements of the thrust vectoring mounts on the boosters influence the roll rate of the vehicle. So I set up a rig, I designed a whole structure to be able to hold it in the horizontal and 3D printed it and assembled it. And in the end, it, uh, it didn't work too well and I had to totally scrap that design. Six months later. I came up with a totally new one that used a uh, uh, off-the-shelf Lazy Susan and allowed a single 3D printed piece to be put onto it to be able to support the vehicle and align it to the center. So this would allow you to test the roll of the vehicle. It put all of the thrust in line and it made it really smooth because it had nice bearings. Uh, to be able to roll the vehicle and test the, uh, the control there. The real Artemis actually rolls about 90 degrees on takeoff uh, to align its azimuth towards its direction of travel. This keeps the boosters uh, flat to the horizon and means when they fall away, they don't really interfere with the core stage. So we want to do the exact same and uh, give ourselves every bit of realism as we can for this flight we have a little bit of experience on flight nine of my Falcon 9 already. That flight proved out a pitch program to roll over the vehicle and pitch it to the side to show how it responds to uh, changing set point in flight. We're doing the exact same thing here, but in a new axis of movement that we haven't previously had any control over. So I set up a roll test rig I fired up those motors and we had a great time where we lit them on fire. This one caught on fire, so that's good. I ran a bunch of roll control tests where I was feeding it all sorts of different set points, having it roll to 90 degrees, and then 45 degrees, and then negative 45 and negative 90, and all over the place on the, uh, the overall roll axis. And after a bunch of revisions, uh, I was able to finally get back to where I had started and actually see the before and after where I wanted of like the vehicles ending up in the final position that I want versus, you know, completely somewhere else. And as things refined more, I had a lot more success in actually getting good controllability. And after a certain point, it was just really, really cool to see how the vehicle would roll on this turntable into position. In the battery of other additions uh, to this whole project, uh, it's been a huge learning experience adding the umbilicals to the existing Falcon 9 vehicle because that vehicle has had great success using those uh, magnetic uh, pogo pin umbilicals. So now the SLS has the same upgrades and they solve some of the problems from the first flight as well that made it end up tipping over. Um, now that the umbilical system can retract and pull away and not interfere with the flight path of the vehicle as much, um, we've solved some of the, uh, the connection problems that we had on the first flight. Um, the real thing has a ton of umbilicals that come off of it, so it's just kind of adding to the overall scale appearance of the, uh, the, the rocket ship taking off. Um, there's one flight controller on this rocket that runs both the boosters and the core stage, and overall the boosters are just completely passive. So when they detach, they have to unplug and completely disconnect from the core stage here um, to be able to fall away. So to make sure that that worked because it didn't work at all on the first flight and I didn't get to test it on the second flight, um, I did a lot of static testing of the differential between the thrust of the two boosters. So you see me shaking uh, the core stage to try and make the boosters fall off. This is simulating the boosters running out of thrust, uh, reaching the end of their burn, 
and the core stage being the only thing left burning and pulling away from the two boosters. Overall, this basically works as uh, uh, the boosters are holding themselves on the bottom of the core stage and the engines are burning. And then once they stop burning, they let go and the, uh, they're no longer supporting the core stage or holding it up from below. And they just kind of fall off and the core stage continues on uh, with more thrust than them. So once we reach that point, we've, uh, we've continued and we separate our boosters. We've also upgraded the cameras on board. There's a new um, 120 frames per second uh, run cam hybrid two on board to be able to record the booster separation and the onboard view of the vehicle, um, just like the real SLS when it took off. So while we're not quite there to launch, uh, and the real one ended up beating me by a little bit to flight, um, I'm very happy with the state of things with this vehicle. Uh, it's very far along in its development and I've learned an absolute ton from the other launch vehicle that I've been flying, which is the, uh, the Falcon 9 back there. And all of that information and learning and knowledge uh, has been applied into this one to make sure that it's successful on the first go. Because like I said, it's a lot more moving parts, it's a lot more stuff going on, and I'm really trying to hedge my bets on being able to get off the ground and fly successfully. There's, there's not many people really running a uh, miniature scale Artemis program out of their guest bedroom. So it's, uh, it's not a lot to go on and you kind of learn as you go. So even if, uh, even if the next launch is a failure, it's one of those things where obviously I'm gonna learn from it and I'm gonna improve. And I'm very excited to kind of continue the whole learning experience this has been uh, since I started. Um, like I said, I started on SLS as a job and I started on SLS as my, uh, my rocketry project for thrust vector control. So going down this whole road, it's kind of been uh, symbolic of my progress. And uh, every time I've learned something, it's gone back into making this a better vehicle. And overall, it's gorgeous when it's sitting on the pad and I know it'll be even better looking in flight. So uh, thank you for staying with me through all this. This one's been a, a little bit longer of a video, I think, um, in recording, but overall, like there's so much that's gone into it. It's hard to distill down to the, uh, the parts and uh, make it into a package that's easily digestible. If you just like the content, let me know um, because I always love hearing good feedback and making sure that um, I'm explaining things well enough and showing some of this technology that I work with in the full scale uh, <laughs> and how it works in the small scale as best I can. So thank you and uh, I'll see you in the next one. And hopefully we have a great uh, successful flight for my mini Artemis one.